we're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Neil Booker. He is the Senior Manager of Inclusion and Diversity at Yext. Neil, it's so good to see you. If you want to share a little about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> well, hi, Christina. Again, my name is Neil. My pronouns are he, his, and I am the head of diversity and inclusion with Yext. Um, the question, uh, and, I, and then I'll give you a little bit about my background. The question I I answered at that time, you know, in regards to what I wanted to be. I remember it being a hybrid of being an athlete in some way, shape, or form. I love basketball, I love football, I love baseball, but I also wanted to be like a representative, like an agent running my own sports agency as I, as I came along. And that was at a fairly young age. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> I didn't quite grow to the height that I wanted to, <laughs> to grow to. So I had to at some point uh, in my, you know, teenage years, come to terms with the fact that I couldn't, you know, make it to the professional setting. Um, but however, the advocacy part, you know, stayed with me. Uh, so throughout my career, I've been able to uh, be uh, a voice of, for the people. I've always been a manager throughout my entire 15 year career, uh, ranging from retail operations to the non for profit sector. Uh, and lastly, my, my past few opportunities that I've had the, the pleasure of working in have been in the tech space. Um, so, and again, that ranges from senior manager of inclusion and diversity to uh, head of, uh, you know, HR operations and on the tech side. So, uh, span the gamut, but really looking forward to having that conversation with you today. Yes, absolutely. I love that you continue to be an advocate for people and really involved in this space as well. I believe you were the first person in this role. Where did you even begin to prioritize where to start and thinking about, you know, all of the projects you could be working on, who to connect with, and starting with uh, the inclusion and diversity strategy at Yax, which I'm sure existed, but with the first person in this role, you get to plan out a little bit, a little bit more. Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> um, you know, the, the really cool part about before I even started to really assume the role was the fact that I had a pretty lengthy interview process. And it gave me a chance to get an understanding of where the company is, how much they actually valued this role. Um, you know, I could have just interviewed with a few folks who I'd potentially be working with most. What I was able to gather from the entire interview process was really being able to see and feel uh, how tangible the need for diverse uh, and inclusive leadership was, but also the fact that there were people that were really in tune with things like as far as initiatives or efforts that needed to be led. Uh, and it allowed me the opportunity to connect with them prior to me joining. So I already had a little bit of a foot in the door with really understanding how to prioritize my time, who I needed to connect with uh, first and foremost. I have, I report directly to our head of people, Chief People Officer Skip, who is fantastic. And he has really afforded me the opportunity to really prioritize um, from the top down. Uh, what he has helped me to navigate through was really, you know, uncharted territory. Like you said, being the first person in this role, you really want to try to use, try, and to use this phraseology, boil the ocean. Uh, and it can be overwhelming. It can be challenging. But one of the things that I uh, adopt was a mission statement, right? Uh, having a North Star of sorts, really helping us to understand what our calling card to diversity and inclusion were going to be. So regardless if you are a Yexter, as folks that we you know are Yex employees and or a client of ours or someone that's looking to join the team, you knew exactly what our company stance is or was going to be as far as diversity and inclusion are. Uh, and then around that, I can start to formalize a strategy, have conversations with key stakeholders, starting with some uh, more influential people like leadership, uh, throughout the company and having fireside chats with employees or from the ind individual contributor and manager level and start to really you know boil out exactly what it is that i need to focus on 30 60 90 days out the really challenging part around developing a more robust 
uh, diverse and inclusive strategy is the fact that there's so much work to do. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, baked into more of the influential components. You don't quite own any of the processes that directly impact diversity and or inclusion. So it really starts, you have to prioritize, or at least I did, with developing those connections, developing those relationships and having those conversations with folks. So then you can come back a few months later or a year later and say, hey, you know, we really developed some strong relationships. We, you know, uh, talked about things that we'd like to see do like to see being done. And now's that time for us to really start to, to make some headway on some of the things that we you know, talked about a few months ago. And that's what we've been able to accomplish thus far. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like from the interview process to date, senior leadership has been really invested in this role and setting you up for success. And also having North Star key pillars of what you're trying to accomplish uh, as well, since there is a lot that can be done, as you said, boiling the, the ocean. Tell me about the are or key pillars of YEX diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, perhaps the mission statement. Absolutely. So we have a three pillar strategy here with YEX, uh, with the first being fostering community, right? So really helping us to understand uh, what the YEX culture is. And it really has all, all of it all been about community. You know, prior to uh, the unfortunate pandemic, I'm not sure if you heard about that, but it's been a thing for the past two years. Um, our our company culture was really office centric, right? There was always something going on. We have a beautiful office space that's recently opened up, uh, and it was really relying upon the connection that was established there in the office. And there's been challenges there because you know we've shifted to be more virtual, and, um, but really wanting to continue to foster that sense of community, whether that's working from office where a lot of our employees have, you know, decided to, you know, from an optional standpoint to go back to the office and reestablishing the connection there. Uh, but regardless of where you uh, work from or where you live, wanting to incorporate that sense of community and continuing to develop that next culture. So that's been one of the key pillars of ours. Uh, and, and the other component of fostering community outside of the internal piece is the external piece. So really ensuring that we're developing from a communal standpoint, our uh, relationships with outside or key stakeholders from uh, the community perspective. Uh, YEX prides itself on being uh, the answers company. And in doing so, we have a number of companies that we work with whose mission statements range from, you know, being better businesses overall to working with not for profits as well. So we wanna ensure that we are developing a healthy sense of community. And what better way to develop a sense of community than to have the people that work at your respective companies look like those that you're doing business with. Uh, and that's how we kind of make those things meld. The second pillar is uh, business innovation. Um, and, you know, part of the business innovation component is ensuring that, you know, from a business standpoint, again, being the best search and answers company, understanding how we can further utilize the skills and talents that we have here in house to develop more inclusive uh, strategies, right? So leveraging different tools that we have in house, uh, whether that's third party applications or developing tools and resources that we have internally as well to create a more uh, uh, inclusive experience for employees here at the company and or working with some of our partners externally to do the same. For instance, if we're talking about and utilizing uh, you know, the affirmative action plans that we've since, you know, we've rolled out uh, over the past year uh, and taking some of those uh, segments of what the uh, directives are from that and incorporating that into our business practices and or something like the disability equality index where, you know, there's hundreds of questions that you're required to uh, answer in order to, you know, leverage against that and saying, hey, this is where we are and this is where we need to be. How can we develop certain tools and, and measures to, and so from a business standpoint that we are up to snuff. And the third pillar is talent. Uh, and under talent, there's a number of, of uh, variables, right? So there's the uh, promotion, there's the retention piece, um, there's also the recruitment piece, right? So I'll start with the recruitment component. Typically, when we think about diversity and inclusion, folks tend to jump right to recruit. Let's just get some folks that look like, you know, the non-majority, non, uh, to fill these roles, right? But we have to think about the retention component because you know there are folks that look like me or folks from underrepresented groups who have been hired at these companies and for the entire time that they've been there, there've been maybe one or two folks that look like them and they kind of go through. Uh, and from the minute that you start working at a company, 
you can see that you may have been the one, one person that interviewed for this role. You're looking at this panel. You're saying, okay, we don't quite have the healthiest of uh, DNI practices. So ensuring that you're not just capturing the recruitment component, but you're looking at the overall talent perspective as it relates to the third pillar. Um, so taking a look at promotability, retention, as far as, uh, for, uh, at least under the talent banner is one of the, the third pillars uh, in terms of our DNI strategy. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like in terms of those three pillars, you're really looking at it from a holistic lens, internal employees, and also the role um, that YEX plays in the external community as well. And this all happens from a strategic effort. There's an ownership mentality from everyone, and it is very intentional. I heard this question at a conference, and I love it in terms of inclusion and diversity. How is YEX intentionally not perpetuating trauma that happens externally in the world? There's so much going on right now internally at the organization. So what we really try to do is ensure that there's an open line of communication, right? So it has to start there. Um, I always liken it to when you see certain things, whether it's clothing lines or uh, certain companies that put out different products, and you say, was there at least one person of color? Was there at least one woman? Or was there at least one person of the LGBTQ plus community to be in that room to say, hey, that's probably not the best idea to run that ad, to put together that piece of cloth that's going to be super offensive. I know things can tend to skew the line of ambiguity when it comes to um, offensive versus non-offensive, but there are some that are just more blatant and obvious. Uh, and ensuring that when we are having these types of, uh, particularly from a large scale perspective, these types of conversations, that we are utilizing resources. Again, going back to the business, business innovation pillar, we're talking about using our team members as a resource. We have a ton of talented folks who are really invested. And I wanna say wholeheartedly, we have the best ERGs at, at YEX, with some of the most invested and passionate and smart and kind uh, employee resource group leads. Uh, and those are the folks that I trust um, because being a DNI leader doesn't mean that you are the end all be all or that you know it all. There, I, I had the opportunity and the pleasure to learn every day, multiple times a day from folks that don't look like me or have different backgrounds. And I'm, I'm just a sponge. And that's the way in which we can continue to, uh, you know, avoid certain missteps, right? So again, in no way, shape or form is the ex living in a bubble and is it perfect or you know not susceptible to some of the the ills that plague the world but one of the ways that we continue to try to push the envelope is to ensure that we have an opportunity for people to be able to say here's what we're seeing out there here's how we want to kind of challenge the status quo i'm i have an, a very very much of an open door policy um sometimes probably too much i mean i i, I take in a lot of requests my team i, I have I also have one, a person that reports to me. She's fantastic. Her name is Rachel. And we take in so many requests and folks want to, you know, act on so many different things. And, you know, again, for anyone that's looking to launch uh, a, a DNI team or just launching DNI initiatives, again, there's no shortage of it. And that's a good problem to have. The problem that comes in, though, is that trying to prioritize all of these different things that people want to do. Um, you know, and then on the opposite side of it, it's like, okay, would you rather have the full autonomy to just kind of be able to do what you need to do at, in a timely manner? Or would you rather, and, and not have the buy-in from all of your uh, constituencies? Or would you rather have a ton of people like we do on our, <laughs> our end where everyone wants to do something, right? Every month there's something, whether that's Black History Month, Women's History Month, uh, this past April, we wrapped up uh, Earth Month with our, with our sustainability ERG, and we're talking about month-long engagements, partnering with our marketing teams. And just to kind of put a uh, bow on your question, one of the additional ways in which we help to develop a, a bit more of an open, open door format, where it's not it's not something that's particularly running strictly through ERGs or someone needing to go to leadership or the manager or even DNI for that matter. There's a ton of resources that are available and templates that are available for folks who either want to start their ERG or have questions around something that we recently developed called the inclusion calendar. So we have a company calendar, which has like 
more of the mandated federal holidays, but then we have the inclusion calendar, which encompasses some of everything. So people can have that open awareness to things that are taking place that you know, folks may not have uh, relevancy towards. Maybe it's culturally relevant. We are an international company. There are folks that, you know, for instance, in Japan, today is, is a holiday, right? And most of us wouldn't know that, but that's incorporated on there, right? So today is Children's Day. So it's just one of those things where, you know, you continue to learn and, and be a sponge and, and continue to be open. And that, that I feel is the only way in which we can continue to uh, change the stigma around what is inclusive and uh, a more diverse company. Yeah, continue to low, continue to learn and have that growth mindset as well, continuously being open to having these conversations, really leading into the discussions. And it sounds like there is a lot of opportunities to raise your hand and be part of those conversations Absolutely. at the company. When there's so much going on, what is your philosophy about measuring diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives and strategies with the caveat that we're not looking to check boxes here, say, okay, we have an equitable workplace, so we're not working on it, but what gets measured gets invested in, and we want to we wanna make sure that we're double tapping on what, what is working really well and really making those investments. That's a great question. Um, we've had a lot of learnings uh, in my time here um, because, again, the initial approach is gathering that momentum and that excitement. Um, folks who want to see change enacted and pretty quickly, you want to leverage that momentum and partners who they have a full time role that they're responsible for, and but they're also passionate about DNI, right? So as someone whose full-time role is DNI, I'm like, I need to leverage this partnership right now. You're willing to invest some of your time to sit on this panel and speak to people at this or at an HBCU. Let's do this right now, right? Uh, but it's interesting you asked that question because I was meeting with our our, our head of, of finance recently, and we were talking about, um, you know ensuring that we are not just spanning ourselves a while mile a, a mile wide to use this phraseology and a foot deep but we're really being more calculated and more strategic right as a company we're, we're figuring out ways to be more efficient uh, more operationally sound and that includes measuring everything that we possibly can to ensure that we are uh, calculating impact and ensuring that we're doing things the right way so I'm, I'm so happy you asked that question because there are comp components of DNI that are more quantitative than there are qualitative, but there are definitely some qualitative things that we, we tend to measure, right? So there's the obvious demographic piece where we want to start seeing some changes um, from an aesthetic perspective or from a background perspective to ensure that folks are uh, being represented uh, in the right way. And if they aren't, what other measurable steps are we taking to ensure that we are partnering with the right people, taking the, the more prescribed steps to ensure that we're improving from a representation standpoint. So from a data standpoint, we're definitely uh, doing that. Uh, secondarily, from a, a quantitative perspective, uh, there's the employee engagement component, right? So it's shifting away from the simple annual company mandated thing where people just have to fill out a survey and you know we'll just figure some things out thereafter. It's like, okay, what happens in between that, right? Um, particularly at a time in which the job market is super hot and we need to be able to conduct some type of a, a check-in with our team members outside of a one-on-one -on -one to really ask, you know, what can we possibly do? Um, and really understanding how much of a lack of representation or how much of a lack of parity as it relates to, you know, the gender pay gap and things that particularly align with uh, diversity are contributing to folks that are leaving these leaving companies, not specific to Yex in this instance, but just in general, right? So uh, going back to your question, uh, we are measuring uh, with a very uh, calculated uh, approach some of the things that are typically assigned to DNI. So again, this, this is the more traditional demogra demographic uh, you know, numbers, there's the hiring, there's the retention component, uh, there's the attrition numbers as well. And then we're also doing, you know, pay equity. Again, that's that's more of the quantitative, you know, numbers. But then the qualitative component of it is ensuring that employees feel seen, heard, valued. And a lot of that starts with the engagement, the checking in piece, 
uh, there's the survey piece, and then there's also the fireside chat. So um, having that level of engagement with team members to ensure that they feel comfortable to be able to provide that real-time tangible feedback, to me, is, is more valuable than anything. Um, but again, the numbers kind of tell you the weather. That's what I tell folks here at this company, right? Um, they tell you the weather, but in order for you to actually get an understanding or, or, or gauge of what the numbers are going to read, having those conversations with your team members and being being in the in the trenches with them so, of sorts really affords you the opportunity to make some change long term. Absolutely. You have to look at all these different pieces of data and really see what the story is at a high level, big picture. If you want to understand how people are feeling, you need to ask and continue to ask in multiple ways throughout the employee experience. There's been a lot of talk around the employee experience and yes. the great places to work, but also toxic workplaces as well, whether it's documentaries, Netflix series, Apple TV series. And there's been a lot of public examples of discrimination that we can go into all of the different headlines. I wanna ask you from your perspective, so not representative of Yext, of course, is there ever mm -hmm. a point of no return for a brand because of the amount of harm they've caused? Um, if not, what is your advice uh, to initiate that intentional repair? And I think this goes back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of the missteps and was there a person of color? Was there a woman? Was there someone in the room when this happened? Um, what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, I, I from my <laughs> perspective, <laughs> tricky one as well. Um, it seems that companies that are, are long-standing pillars in their particular industries can find a way to absorb the blow, right? Um, others who may not have the panache or the cachet or may not be household names, um, when they have super toxic workplaces, um, the CEO has allowed for these things to happen for quite some time. And there's just story after story and there are folks that are particularly those that have underrepresented groups um, who can really associate some of their experiences with what they've seen, heard, or read. Um, it really leaves a stain on certain companies and, and many of them can't bounce back. So I really think it depends on um, the company itself and, and how well they've been structured or insulated in a way. Um, we all know, you know, I, I have, I can, pretty much guesstimate what your what company you were alluding to, but I quite honestly think uh, the downturn to it was because of the lack of financial acumen <laughs> or, you know, just with the expenditures and operational functionality of the company that really led to a detriment and it was compounded by the toxic work culture. Um, but a lot of them are able to absorb the blow because they can pay out hundreds of millions of dollars, unfortunately, and still be able to uh, financially recover in some way, shape, or form. But for those who actually care about company culture, and I'm speaking from an employee perspective versus an employer perspective, there are certain companies that personally I would never work for because I've seen these things, right? And I see you shaking your head. So I would imagine yeah. we're aligned in that fact, right? So I think for those of us who care about um, seeing our peers happy and seeing our peers respected and valued and knowing that that type of behavior doesn't just, you know, happen to one person in a vacuum. If that happened there at one point, there's a good chance it can happen to me or somebody that looks like me or a friend of mine or coworker. And for those reasons, I just couldn't work for a certain companies thereafter. So, but great question though. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. I appreciate your opinion as well. We're definitely aligned in that, you know, we there are different circumstances for different sides of organizations and also, as employees and as consumers, we have options and choices of, you know, where our dollars go, where our employment goes to. Uh, Neil, I know we're ending, uh, we're nearing the end of our time together. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or underscoring one to two key takeaways you hope people bring with them? I'll pass the mic back to you. Yeah. So for one, you didn't get, you didn't ask me if I plan to join another All Voices panel. I did not. Uh, <laughs> no, but and I and I enjoyed our uh, the last one. So you let me know when there's another one coming up, and I'll be there. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, for those who don't know Christina, she's amazing. So uh, thank you for the oh work that you do. I didn't you, even pay him to say that. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know, two key takeaways for me. For one, 
would be uh, just exhibit patience with yourself if you are leading uh, diverse or inclusive initiatives, whether that's your title or not. Uh, be patient with others who may not necessarily have the vision around what that could look like. And again, that vision changes. So being patient with yourself, uh, I, I think is key. And then secondly, uh, which is tied back to patients, which is just being realistic. If you're talking about a company that, again, longstanding history, uh, where they may not necessarily have, you know, really had healthy, inclusive or diverse practices, and you're just starting out, you're fighting or swimming against the tide, right? So set realistic, uh, tangible requests for yourself, uh, for others, and you know that's the only way that you can tangibly start to measure uh, what success looks like, and you can kind of define success around that. So being patient, but also being realistic around what you can do, when you can do it. Uh, again, going back to, to uh, my chief HR uh, person who said, you know, boiling the ocean is, is a good way to, to kind of over overwhelm yourself or frustrate yourself. So you know, being patient with your execution is really key because you're trying to you know, really set forth a strategy that can be long lasting uh, and, and ever changing in this space and in this world, which is relatively new comparative to the industries that we're actually working in. So mm -hmm. uh, being patient and being realistic, I think would be two key takeaways that I leave with the audience. Those are two really good key takeaways. Neil, as always, it was good to see you. Thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employers and employees being seen, heard, and understood, and know it's a requirement for the company to succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.